Good morning. I want to welcome you, welcome you to the Soda Springs Community Presbyterian Worship Service. Today we're celebrating All Saints Day, a memorial service of saints who have gone before us. Now we will light the candles. I praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will be glad and rejoice in your coming. Strong in faith and eager in questions, singing our praise and whispering our prayers, we come to be your people, O oh God. Now we offer our prayer of confession. We do not always love as you would have us love. We do not always do as you would have us do. In our stubbornness, we turn from you when we should turn towards you. Our lives are full of mistakes and errors, places where we do not follow the one true God. We are not alone in these mistakes. All those who have come before us also were plagued with temptation and sin. Let us come before God just as generations of believers have done and pray for God's forgiveness and grace. Hear now the silent fears and worries of our hearts. Friends, hear the good news. Though thousands upon thousands of our ancestors did not follow God's ways perfectly, we have hope in the one who did, Jesus, a man of a particular people in a particular time, taught through his words and deeds that God has already forgiven us. Thus, we all who have come before us are rightly known as saints, the holy ones of God. Hear the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God for God's mercy, grace, and love. Amen. Every week we have a list of people and causes that we pray for. We pray for those who are suffering physically, mentally, and emotionally. We pray for those who are mourning the loss of loved ones. We pray for our community and for all world leaders. We pray for this world, for places and people who are struggling to recover from hurricanes and floods and raging fires. We pray for peace among nations and make us instruments of that peace. Let us say together, we pray to you, O Lord. Gracious God, you lurk quietly in the loneliest places in our hearts, keeping watch. You grieve with us in our devastations, our losses, and our fears. You journey with us in our celebrations, our defeats, and even our monotony of our days. You love us. You have so richly blessed us with life, with love, and joy, with hope in the midst of chaos and despair. Hear us now, O oh God, as we pray following Christ as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we will continue our worship through the communion of our Lord.
Friends, this is the joyful table of the people of God and sit at the table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at the table with his disciples, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust him to share with the feast that he has prepared. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, O God, through your beloved servant, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent in these last times as Savior and Redeemer and messenger of your will. He is your word inseparable from you. Remember, therefore, his death and resurrection. We set before you this bread and cup, thankful that you have counted us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you as your priestly people. We ask that you send your Holy Spirit upon the offering of the Holy Church. Gather into one all who share these holy mysteries, filling them with the Holy Spirit and confirming their faith in the truth that together we may praise you and give your glory through your servant, Jesus Christ. Through him, all glory and honor are yours, almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. And so he took the bread and gave thanks to you and said, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup saying, This is my blood shed for you. When you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And let us pray. Eternal God, we give thanks to you for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit. Give to give thanks for ourselves and for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This morning's our sermon is um, actually titled, I'm the Favorite. Um, it comes from Matthew 5, verses 1 through 12, um, the Beatitudes. Hear the good news of the gospel. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him. And he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for, their for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Hear and receive the word of God. A few years ago, a group of Christians from the United States visited war-torn Nicaragua. While there, a young man in this group was killed by the Contras. This left the group confused and full of questions. On the next Sunday, a memorial service was held from the altar, the priest said, Peace of the Lord be with you. And people from the congregation, Nicaraguan people, began to embrace these Americans and say paz or peace. These people who had suffered so much in so many ways were passing the peace of Christ. 
during the communion of service, there was a pause. The congregation was silent. Then someone called out a name. In one voice, everyone responded, Presente. Another name was called out. Once again, the response, Presente. During the service, at least 20 names were called out, and each time the same response, Presente. Presente. Ron Dalbin, the pastor leading this group of Christians, did not understand what was happening until he heard the name Oscar Romero. Then he realized that all the names were those of persons who had died. From that moment on, he joined in shouting, Presente! Presente is used by school children to answer the roll call. At the Lord's table, the word presente means in our midst or present with us. Shouting presente in this worship service was a way of proclaiming the reality of the communion of saints. Although these persons named had all died, their presence and influence was still felt. Today we celebrate All Saints Day. We remember those persons who have influenced our faith and development, whose presence is still felt in our lives, even though they now rest from their labors. All Saints Sunday is a church memorial day, a time to remember and give thanks to God for all those have, who have died in faith. With these thoughts in mind, let us go now to the mountain where Jesus is teaching. He begins with a list of Beatitudes. These Beatitudes form a picture of the life of a saint. On this All Saints Day, let's consider three of the more difficult of these Beatitudes to see if you and I are even close. Saints are persons, first of all, who live their lives trusting nothing other than Jesus. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For Jesus, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is not praising their virtues of poverty. He is honoring the virtues of faith in God. God is our ultimate source of security. We think we have enough money, enough land, enough possessions. We will be in control of our lives. We will be protected. We will have security. Many of us can identify with a couple who said they saved money by going over their household budget every single night. And someone asked, how does that save you money? They responded, by the time we make any sense of this situation, it's too late to go out shopping for anything. Six days ago on the news, I, I found this. Tropical Storm Zeta stalls in the Caribbean as Hurricanes Epsilon pass the eastern U.S., California, 100,000 people without power amid an extreme wildfire risk. Weather Watch records a number of hurricanes that make landfall in the U.S. in 2020. California, autumn heat wave spark fears of new wildfires. People who are caught in these situations know that control is an illusion. People who have experienced devastating illnesses know that in this world, there is no security. The most control I've seen lately is the major media who are attempting to control our feelings and our thoughts these days. There are times when only faith in God can pull us through. A young pastor tells about the most de devastating event of his life, the death of his mother. At first, his mother complained of a pain in her side. 
The pain would not go away. She went to a doctor, but nothing could be found. A few weeks later, a CAT scan revealed that her entire colon and liver were covered with cancer. Four months later, his mother died with her entire family gathered around her bed as she breathed her last breath. His mother was a beautiful person, this pastor writes, because of her deep faith in God and her commitment to her family. She never complained about her pain or about her life being cut short at the age of 49. Throughout her suffering, his mother would say, I thank God for my family and for my life. Even though she was diagnosed with terminal cancer, his mother radiated joy that comes from placing her total trust in God. Each morning, her husband would say, this is the day that the Lord has made. And courageously, she would respond, let us rejoice and be glad in it. That is saint-like faith, living life, trusting nothing other than God. Saints are also persons who submit to the will of God. Blessed are the meek, said Jesus, for they will inherit the earth. In the original Greek, Greek meant, meek meant literally the tamed or the broken. As a wild horse is broken, a wild horse is of no use to anyone except, but a meek or gentle horse can be used for children to ride on. Meekness is a matter of submission to God's will. Submission is something that we're not very good at. We tend to, f- to fight to the very end, at a last resort. You know, when all else fails, read the instructions. Here's a cute story from Timmy, a first grader who seemed really upset when he walked into the principal's office and asked to use the phone. Can I help with something? The principal asked Timmy. Then Timmy explained, Yesterday, I forgot my sweater at school. This morning, my mother told me not to come home without my sweater, and I can't find it anywhere. I need to call her and ask her where she wants me to go. For many of us, life is one long battle for control. First with our parents, then with our teachers, then our employers, even ourselves. That is a humbling effect of a bad habit. We discover that we can't control even ourselves. As a mother, that was a rude awakening for me, when, when, especially with teenagers. That's when I learned what a controller I am, or at least I thought I could be. Someone finally said to me, even a small child won't go to sleep if they don't want to. Just because you said, close your eyes and sleep, doesn't mean that they will. Do your homework doesn't mean they're going to do it just because the book is open. Don't run in the street sort of works if you're there watching. We only have one hope, to yield to God, God's control. When we are able to do that, we can rest assured that God will take care of us. William Henson recalls a time when his children were younger and one child's pet died. Dr. Henson says that he practiced replacement therapy When one pet died, it was replaced by another pet. One time his youngest daughter, Kathy's cat died. Together they went to find another pet. Kathy selected a tiny peekaboo. When they got home, Dr. Henson 
agreed to build a doghouse for the new pet to live in. The only kind of dog I knew very much about was a really big bird dog, he replies. So when I got home, I built the doghouse. I built a very large doghouse. In fact, the house was way too large for this small dog. The size of the dog's house scared the poor little peekapoo. No matter what they did, the little dog would not go near the house. They would put his food in there, and he would go hungry. They would put his water in there, and the dog would not drink. In exasperation, Dr. Hinton admit, I would shove him in and hold my hands over the door. But the minute I would move, he would run out, unbelievably frightened. Nothing worked. The little dog would not go into his house, no matter what I did to entice him. In disgust, Dr. Henson went inside and sat down at the den while his daughter Kathy stood outside crying over his da her dad's impatience and refusal of the puppy to cooperate. After a while, Kathy got down on her hands and knees and crawled into the doghouse herself. When she crawled inside, something wonderful happened. That puppy trotted right in beside her and stretched out on the house of the floor of the doghouse. Before too long, the dog was taking a nap. All fear was taken out of darkness because the one whom he loved and trusted had preceded him into the dark and frightening place. It is no longer causing him fear. There's a lesson here for us. We can surrender our will to God's will, knowing that God loves us. Wherever he leads us, he will be with us. We don't have to enter a dark dog house alone. Saints trust in God and God alone. Saints submit their will. Finally, saints are people who no matter what happens to them, stand firm in faith. Jesus knew that he addressed his disciples on the mountain, that, they, that one day would come when they would be persecuted for believing in him. Jesus knew that living the kind of life that he outlined would be difficult. In his final beatitude, Jesus tried to warn the disciples that the Christian's life may sometimes be very difficult. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you under all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Jesus told his disciples, when those things happen, they are bound to happen at one time or another. Jesus says, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. All through the ages, there have been saints who have suffered because of their Christian convictions. They took unpopular stands, but they remained strong in their faith. They did not waver in the face of adversity. Such persons are examples for us. They offer us a word of hope. They endured, so and so can we. When Margaret Helmsky was seven, she received a gift from her grandmother. It was a tiny cross on a wisp of gold chain, so fine it was barely perceptible. Never forget what this cross means, her grandmother said, as she fastened it carefully around Margaret's neck. Over the years, Margaret says that the cross became a part of her, just like the lone freckle on her left cheek. She could look at herself in the mirror and not even see it. As a graduate of psychology student, she took a job tutoring at a school for emotionally disturbed children. Suddenly, surrounded by children who express, expressed their displeasure by kicking and biting and screaming, she was terrified. 
though determined not to let it show. On her first night there, the head counselor said that three of the boys had asked to escort her to dinner alone. How would she handle if all three of these boys decided to act out at once? She swallowed hard. She desperately needed this job, and so she fought back the panic and walked with her charges to the dining hall. They passed through the cafeteria line as tantrums and fights erupted around them. Fortunately, none of these boys exhibited any of the behavioral outbursts they were used to. They made their way to the table in the center of a busy cafeteria, and the boys took their seats. Margaret picked up her fork and was about to take the first bite when she noticed all three boys were staring at her. What's the matter, she asked. Aren't you going to ask the blessings, asked the eight-year-old Peter. I didn't think I was supposed to, she responded. Isn't this a state-run school? Yes, said David, his eyes brimming, but you were a cross. Her grandmother's words surged to the surface of her memory. Never forget what this cross means, her grandmother said. We thought that meant something, said Roman, clearly disappointed. It does. Thank you for reminding me, Margaret says. And she bowed her head, no longer afraid. Margaret learned something about sainthood that day. Saints trust in God, trust in God and God alone for their ultimate security. Saints submit their will to God. Stand firm in their witness to their faith. I've known a few saints in my time, haven't you? My maternal grandparents were saints. They lived in California, not far from an Indian school. These kids lived at the school, and every week my parents would go and pick up a couple of these kids and bring them to their homes. They did small jobs to earn a little spending money. They would weed grandma's flowers, help grandpa with woodworking projects, or learn how to cook something really yummy, just like she taught me to cook. Often they would take them shopping or to some special church functions. They didn't have the same kids every time, but they always sat down together for a great dinner before they went back to school. I never heard my grandparents say anything bad about anyone, except that one time when my grandmother told me she would never buy that laundry detergent from a commercial on TV because the same actor on that commercial was a horrible person on her show. I think that show was Days of Our Lives. He was just a mean man, she said. But I have never heard my grandparents complain. They didn't preach at me, but I knew that God was first in their lives. They were always available to me, and I knew without a doubt I was their favorite. When my grandmother died, my grandfather told me that he and Grandma always prayed that someday all of their children would be together in church. And there they were. At my grandfather's funeral, a photograph was displayed of him with a little girl sitting at a table while she painted his fingernails. Was this little girl me? No, but it could have been. It seemed to me that this little girl was every one of his kiddos, as he called us. That's when I realized that every grandchild and great-grandchild also believed, 
without a doubt. Okay, we're his favorite. And I believe we were. I suppose my grandparents weren't perfect, but I didn't see that. However, they did fit these three criteria. They were trusting, submitting, and standing firm. This week, as you go about your lives, think not only about the saints you have had in your lives, but think about how you can turn your lives around towards Jesus, trusting God and submitting your will of God and standing firm in your faith. I hope that you had someone in your life like my grandparents. My grandparents touched my life and all who knew them. On this All Saints Day, I would like to say one thing in their behalf. Grandpa and Grandma Schrader, presente. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for all of the saints in our lives, those who are living and those of blessed memories. Amen. And may the peace of the Lord follow you all the days of your life. And all God's people say, Alleluia. Amen. <laughs>